Hey guys, hope you're doing all right. Uh, it is another wonderful Sunday morning, so I'd like to uh, just welcome you into our online Sunday school uh, message today. Uh, as always, uh, I hope that you guys are involved in discussions as much as you can, um, and that um, you, you talk with your classmates, you talk with your teachers, and kind of share um, some things that you learned and um, some things that you know maybe you want to learn. Um, but I want to start off with some announcements. This, uh, well, tonight at, at 6 o'clock, we're going to meet together in the conference room right across the hall from the office, and we're going to have our second week of Super Sunday. Uh, I, I do want to encourage you guys to come out if you can. Uh, it's going to be an awesome time of uh, just worship, of scripture, um, and just learning God's word and, and a little bit of fellowship and discussion times. Uh, last week went great. Um, and, um, and I do want to encourage you guys to come out to that. Uh, Thursday uh, is going to be game night, so we're going to have board games, video games, and it's just going to be an awesome, fun time. Uh, same time in the fellowship hall, 6 p.m. on Thursday. Um, if you haven't gotten a form yet, please let me know. And um, if you stop by either on Sunday or on Thursday, you can grab it then. And if you are unable to, uh, please let me know so I can uh, send it out to you. All right. So if you want a t-shirt, I need them by the 21st and I'm planning on mailing out a batch tomorrow. So if you can tell me uh, by today, um, I'll send out the first batch of, of, the, um, of the forms uh, tomorrow. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. So we've been kind of talking about um, what discipleship means, right? So uh, some qualities of followers of God. And we've talked about how they uh, need to they need to want to know uh, know God um, more intimately. They need to be pursuing Him. They need to be living for Him. Um, but now we're going to talk about how we do that, right? So basically, the idea today is that Jesus left us um, a blueprint on how we should live, um, and how more importantly that we should pray. Uh, so what God honoring prayer looks like can be found through how Jesus was praying. And so first things first, we have to talk about what prayer is. And so think really quickly about what prayer means to you and what prayer is. Um, and there's a lot of different opinions, uh, especially from different cultures and um a lot of these cultures might view prayer a little differently than we do. So why do you think that there might be so many different views on prayer? That's your first discussion question. And I want you to make sure that you memo these down if you can and talk about it with your group. So why do you think that there are so many different views um, on prayer? Depending on culture, depending on region, whatever it may be. Um, so we're going to read uh, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 5 through 8, all right? So as always, I encourage you guys to have a physical Bible with you um, if you can. Nothing beats the actual Word of God in your hands at the moment, all right? So we're going to read verses 5 uh, through 8. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8 goes a little like this. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And so what's the first thing that Jesus says about prayer? He says, don't be like the hypocrites. He warns us how not to pray before he teaches us how to pray, right? Um, so what is the, the way that these hypocrites are approaching prayer? The, the hypocrites goal with their prayer, right? Is to look good in front of other people. And that was their mistake. Instead of, um, instead of growing in their relationship with God, they decided that, hey, I want to look good in front of other people because I know a lot of, of big words. I know how to make my prayer sound really nice. 
and I just want to seem really articulate and eloquent in front of all these other people. And so they make their prayers as elaborate as possible so that it sounds good to the eye, uh, to the ears of man. So, uh, second discussion question. Uh, I wouldn't say question so much as activity. Um, give give an example of what you think uh, one of these prayers that impress others would sound like. And so, in your discussion groups, if you can, um, just real quickly, write down. Uh, what one of these prayers, like these Hippocratic uh, prayers would sound like, right? Um, so now let's talk about, since Jesus told us how not to pray, how does he want us to pray? And so based on these four verses that we just read, what does Jesus want our prayer to look like? He literally says to go into a room by ourselves, right? So do you think that Jesus um, means that we can only really pray when we're in a room by ourselves? No, that'd be ridiculous. But what he's saying is that he prayed in front of his followers, in front of other people all the time. But Jesus is saying that instead of thinking about other people when you pray, think fo uh, focus solely on God. And so just like last week, we talked about retreating, right? We go away from other people. We go away from our distractions to pray to God. And while it may not be physically possible for us to do that all the time, spiritually and mentally, we can retreat to a place where we don't have to worry about other people. And that's what Jesus is saying. He is saying that prayer is based on an intimate relationship with God, not other people, just God. And for that to happen, we can't be thinking about other people, um, well, impressing other people. You could be thinking about other people when you're praying for them, obviously. Uh, so why do you think Jesus warns us about babbling, though? So when we babble, when we pray, right, it's because we're trying to impress God with our words. We're trying to make our prayer sound nice to God, make our prayer sound appealing to God. So that maybe, you know, he'll be more willing to listen to us if we use three, four, five syllable words, right? Um, but that's not the case. He tells us uh, on verse 8 that he already knows before we even ask. God already knows what you need. God already knows what you want way before you even have to ask him in, in prayer. And so instead of uh, us talking to our parents where we have to, you know, butter them up, we have to remind them of all these good things that we did. We have to remind them like, hey, uh, dad, I know you love me and, you know, I mowed the lawn, I did the dishes. And so uh, is it OK if you buy me uh, this video game or, or this new bike or whatever it may be? But God already knows. We don't have to dance around our words. We don't have to. Uh, we don't have to make our our questions and our requests sound really nice and fluffy. Right? He's saying that once again that the that the idea of prayer is about communicating and growing intimately with God. And so let's move on to the next uh, set of passages, verses nine through 15, all right? And it goes like this. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So Jesus gives his followers a prayer that they should be praying. And so that, uh, Christians for thousands of years at this point have been praying this prayer, right? This isn't the only prayer that we can pray. Jesus didn't say that you can only pray, pray like this, but this comes um, in the cusp of his disciples asking how they should be praying. And so what Jesus has done is that he's given us the blueprint, the idea, what our prayer should look like, an example of it, not a carbon copy. And so it's, it's kind of like uh, Jesus is showing us how we can pray in a way that honors God. 
And so real quick, I want you to take a few seconds, pause the video if you have to, but jot down some ideas that you can share with your discussion groups about what this prayer uh, looks like. What are some qualities of this prayer um, in relation to things that we talked about earlier on in this video? So when Jesus uh, communicates with God um, in his prayer, right? what is he saying? So the first thing we realize is that he says, uh, Our Father in heaven, right? hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's the first verse of that prayer. So if we break it down, we say that God is our Father, right? So that's what Jesus is praying. God, my Father, our Father. He is in heaven, right? Therefore in command of the universe. Hallowed be your name, the, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done. Right? on earth as it is in heaven. So uh, just as God uh, has dominion, complete dominion over heaven, he is saying that through us, that his will also be done on earth. So by saying that our Father in heaven, Jesus communicates that God loves us deeply. Right? He's not saying, oh God in heaven above, oh God so far away from reach, oh God who is you know, um, someone who doesn't care about us. He's saying that our God, our Father, right? Like, it's not anybody. It's not some random God that we don't know. It's our Father in heaven, right? There's an intimacy in there. And so let's look at um, the things that Jesus invites his disciples to pray about, right? Um, in this prayer, right, let's look at verses 10 through 13, all right? I'm not going to read through it again. Uh, but what specific things does Jesus tell his disciples to pray for? He tells them to um, to pray that God's will will be a reality on earth, right? That his will be done on earth. That we would receive all of our daily needs, the food and necessities uh, for daily living, right? And, this, uh, and then uh, that we don't really need to make, uh, sorry, uh, that God would forgive our debts, that he would forgive us just as we forgive others. That we would be delivered from temptation and the evil one. So these are the things that God, uh, that Jesus told us to pray about every time we pray. And so what do you think about the fact that the first personal request that Jesus mentions um, in his prayer is for a physical need, his, his daily bread, than a spiritual one? If, if, if Jesus really did care about our spiritual needs above our physical needs, right? If he knew already that, you know, it's all about our, our spirit and our, and our soul, right? Being nourished first before our body, then why did he mention our daily bread? It's because God doesn't only care about what's inside of you. God also understands your needs. God loves you and he wants to take care of you, not only in the spiritual aspect, but also in the physical aspect. Because we don't really need to make a distinction. We don't need to separate the idea of God caring for us physically and God caring us for us spiritually. We just put it all together and we say that God cares about us. Isn't that awesome? And so we've learned in, in the series for the past couple of weeks, uh, months, that all of our sin, past, present, and future, right, were forgiven by Jesus' work uh, on the cross when, he sur when we surrender our lives to him. So why do you think that Jesus wants his followers to ask for forgiveness in this prayer? If everything's already been wiped clean, if our sins um, from dating back from when we were born so when we die, have already been forgiven, then why do we need to constantly ask for forgiveness from God? Right? Like, when you, when you put that trust in Jesus, right? All of the eternal consequences are taken away. Right? So the, the ultimate price for sin has already been paid. We are wiped clean. And so our relationship with God was restored and Jesus took all the bad stuff up on the cross with him when he died. But our relationship with God can, while our no longer, um, sorry, while our relationship with God can no longer be destroyed by sin, right, it could still impair that relationship. 
it could still make that relationship more difficult than it needs to be. It could hurt that relationship. And so when we ask for forgiveness daily, what we're really doing is we are recognizing that we are sinners that are saved solely by grace, right? And that, um, that we need God's forgiveness daily. So this is really important here because it's not just a, a one-time ticket and we're done, right? Because our, our, our Jesus' price that he paid wasn't just so that we would go to heaven, right? That's only the first part. It was to have that relationship with God, to have that intimate um, father-son, father-daughter relationship with God that we need. And sin is only going to impair it. So why should we ask for God to not to lead us into temptation? Why not just stop doing stupid stuff, right? Like, why not just do the things that wouldn't lead us into temptation in the first place, right? And it's because God's grace saves us from our sin. And right? His grace and His presence, right, through the Holy Spirit, empowers us to be obedient to Him. Right? Because those temptations are always going to exist. Those temptations to do sinful things is always there. So while we wrap it up, I want to look back on verses 14 and 15 again, all right? So for if you ask, if, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So if our salvation was solely based on God's grace, then why is it so important for me to forgive someone else? And why does it say my forgiveness is contingent on how I forgive others? This is your third discussion question. I want you guys to think about it, bring up some answers, talk about it with your groups, right? But um, if you want the answer, go ahead and skip to the end of this video. Uh, I mean, stay in the skip to the end of the video, and um, and we'll talk about it a little more. But your fourth discussion question is why is it sometimes so hard to forgive others? So, question three. Why do we need to forgive others if God has already forgiven us? Right? And then question four, why is it so hard to forgive others? So this is, uh, this is the lesson for today. Once again, um, if you are wanting the answer, uh, make sure you stick around after the prayer and I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, but if this is something that you want to think about and that you want to pray about and you want to bring up to discussion, um, you can always rewatch it later, all right? So let's pray. Let me pray over you guys and um, and we'll wrap it up, all right? Father, we just thank you for this awesome time together in your word, in your message, Lord. I pray that we take our prayer life seriously, and that we understand the value and the magnitude um, that prayer has, that we understand that it's not just about receiving salvation, it's about receiving an intimate relationship with you, God. That's what it's always been about. And salvation is only a small portion of that. I pray that they grow in their walk daily with you, that even in these dark times, in these tough times where we are not able to meet regularly, that they that they still focus on their relationship with you, Lord. I pray, I pray that you bless them, that you protect them, especially uh, during all of this COVID, and that you continue to just mold them in your image, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, once again, guys, love you. Um, and if you want to, you know, kind of uh, hear me talk about it a little bit, then make sure you stay tuned, all right? Um, so if we go back to the idea right, of forgiving others before we receive forgiveness, um, we have to recognize two important truths. Right? Followers of Jesus who have accepted God's forgiveness right, will be characterized, will be de defined by how uh, by forgiving others. Right? It says in the Bible, right, we forgive because He forgave us first. Like, we don't forgive because we're nice people. We don't forgive because we've done all these amazing things. We forgive because God forgave us first. Right? And so it's not really a matter of how you feel. It's not really a matter of how I feel. It's a matter of doing it because, one, God's called us to do it. And two, he showed us how to do it. All right? Second point. Um, just as in Matthew 6, 12, right? Jesus is referring to the fact 
that our sin can still impair our relationship with God. And so our sin, our sinful lives and sinful choices, even though we've already received our salvation through Jesus Christ, can still hurt that relationship with God. And this is no different. By holding these grudges, by holding this hatred in our hearts, we are sinning against God. And it is going to hurt and impair our relationship with Him. And so when we are unforgiving towards others, it hinders our intimacy. It hinders our ability to come before God and to ask for forgiveness uh, from Him. Like we need to on a daily basis, right? So that's all I have for you guys. Um, once again, I will check back with you. I hope to see you on Sunday, um, Sunday night especially, and as well as Thursday. All right? Uh, love you guys.